chapter 12, verses, we'll start at verse 9. Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 9. If you have your pew Bibles, it's found on page 1101. If you brought your own Bible, I'm glad that you did. If you brought your own device, I'm glad that you did. But I would ask that you, uh, you get there one way or the other. And um, again, it's so great to take the Bible, whether it's printed or on your device, so that you have access to it, so that you understand how to navigate it, so you know how to get to different verses and be able to um, apply God's Word and be able to have it right at your fingertips no matter where you are, not just Sunday morning. Romans chapter 12. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've been studying this idea, this concept of, of being peacemakers. And, and as, I, as I said last week, uh, the reason that we are peacemakers is because of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. We see in Colossians 1 verses 15 to 20 that God is restoring and reconciling all things to himself through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. First and foremost, he's restoring us to himself through Jesus Christ. What we saw last week is that like any other biblical thing, when God does something for us, God never intends for that to be where it stops. Right? When he shows love, when he shows grace, when he shows forgiveness, when he reconciles, it's not that, okay, I've done it, and then you're the place where it stops, but instead, I've done it, and now it flows through you. And now you get to show that love, that grace, that forgiveness, that reconciliation to those around you because of what I've done for you first. And as we think about that concept of reconciliation, of making peace with those around us, I can't help but think about how when we as peacemakers, we become people who are really authentic Christians. We are Christians to our core. We are Christians who are consistent. And, and what I, I was thinking about this week is that more and more people are looking for authenticity. More and more people are looking for authenticity. If you could switch that. There we go. Um, we have to go back, actually. Um, I just did it twice. There we go. Um, I think it was in Mere Christianity that C.S. Lewis talks about rats in the cellar. Maybe you've heard this analogy from C.S. Lewis before, but he says sometimes that as Christians, you know, we say, you know, I, I was so caught off guard by the way that someone treated me, by the thing that someone said to me that, you know, I just responded and, and just brought the hammer down on them, you know, and, and it was because I was tired, it was because I was hungry, it was because I was stressed, it was because, you know, we have five kids or whatever other excuse we might come up with, you know, because of that, I responded the way I did, I reacted the way I did and was not loving and gracious at all to the person who hurt me. And what C.S. Lewis says is that as Christians, that's really not an excuse for us. And he said, you know, sometimes when he would go down into his cellar, when he would go down into his basement, uh, one of the things that he would do uh, to make sure that, that it was clear down there and it was safe to go down there is he would flash the lights because where he was in the UK, there were lots of rats in the cellar. So if he flashed the lights, if he pounded his feet on the stairs, it gave them enough warning, enough of a heads up to scurry and go hide and be out of the way so that by the time he got there, it was safe. There weren't any rats in the cellar. And he said, but if I didn't do that, if I went down there and kind of surprised him, I got to see what was really going on. I got to see what the condition of my cellar really was. And what he says is that we as Christians have rats in the cellar as far as the sinfulness of our hearts. We don't get people pounding the steps and flashing the lights to give us a heads up to say, hey, clear things out, be ready, make sure that, that you take care of all the, the garbage so that when, when someone does something wrong, you're ready for it. But instead, we're called to have that place that's clean, that place where our hearts are in the right place and that place of authenticity where we say, you know what, no matter what, even if I'm caught off guard, even if I am stressed out or hungry or tired or have five kids, I want my cellar, I want my heart to be a place that's clean and a place that's able to deal with the difficulties of life. That's ultimately what we read in verse 9 of Romans chapter 12. 
Paul says, love must be sincere. If we had the Greek in front of us, it would just say two words. Sincere love. Some think that Paul has kind of a heading here like we do in our Bibles where it's edited and there's, there's different headings that sort of say what are we going to be talking about here. Some think that Paul gives a heading there. Sincere love. We've put in those, those verbs in the middle to say love must be sincere or sincere is love if we want to take a Yoda translation, right? But, but really what's being said here is that what Paul's going to be talking about is love that's authentic. Love that's sincere. Love that goes all the way to our heart and not just something on a surface level, but something that goes to the core of who we are. What we find is that from the outset, we see that this has to do with desire. From the outset, we see this has to do with desire. We continue in verse 9. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Love must be sincere. Hate what's evil. Cling to what's good. These are powerful verbs that Paul is using here. When he says hate, he's saying abhor what is evil. Right? Make it so that you can't stand what's evil. That you want nothing to do with evil. The word cling here means have a kind of relationship that a husband and wife have. Right? Cleave to what is good. Become one with what is good. Be consumed by what is good. And we might immediately jump to kind of the moral issues of our day. We might say as far as, you know, the way the culture is going, or we might say the way, is, the way of politics or way of, of policy and our government, you know, we might immediately jump to that and say, you know, I, I hate the evil things that are happening, and that's, this is a good call for me to, to hate what's evil, and I love what's good as far as the way that God describes how things are supposed to be. There's a place for that, but I really don't think that that's what Paul is talking about here in our passage. I really think that Paul is talking about love and as far as and relationships. Um, there's, there's consistently throughout the Bible a call to hate evil things and love good things. And so if you need to hear that today, uh, let me say that today. That it's really important that morally and as far as being different from the world around us, that's great. And I encourage that because Scripture is consistent about that. But what we're talking about here is how to relate to other people. Jump with me, you have your Bibles open, jump with me to verse 18. I think this is really proof positive what... Paul is talking about. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Love must be sincere. If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So when Paul is talking about hating what's evil and clinging to what's good, he's talking about relationships. So hate what's evil, like seeking out division like desiring division, like fostering your anger, like holding on to your grudge. Hate that kind of stuff. That has nothing to do with sincere love. That has nothing to do with being at peace with everyone. Cling to what's good as far as seeking out reconciliation, as far as desiring peace, as far as fostering forgiveness, as far as holding on to relationships rather than grudges. Because first and foremost, the question is, do we want to make things right or do we want to keep things broken when things get off track? So it's a question of priorities. As we see in our text, when we reconcile, we have right priorities. When we reconcile, we have right priorities. That's what verse 10 tells us. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. When Paul says those words, above yourselves, what he's saying is, we need to lay down our pride when we're wrong. We need to lay down our pride when we've done something to harm someone else, when we've spoken out of turn and hurt someone's feelings, when we've done something that's wrong and damaging to someone else. We need to lay down our pride to be able to say, I honor our relationship more than myself. We're going to have to jump back. We're doing one or two or zero at a time here as far as the slides. Noah, if you could jump back for us. 
When I have right priorities, it means, too, that if I overreact when someone's done wrong to me, whether it's my wife or my kids or my parents or a friend or a coworker, whoever it is that's done me wrong, if I've overreacted and said, well, you know what, they hurt me first, I have to honor them above myself to say, I have to accept what I've done. I have to tell it like it is. I have to seek out reconciliation and forgiveness. We continue in verse 11. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Zeal has to do with passion. Zeal has to do with our desire. Zeal has to do with our hearts. Who are you serving when you have zeal for restoration, for reconciliation? You're serving the Lord. There's some practical ways to do that. Verses 12 and 13. Be joyful in hope. And have hope that things can get better. Be patient in affliction. Know that it's going to take time. Be faithful in prayer. Right? Bring this before God. We've been thinking about prayer all year. We're going to think about prayer throughout the rest of the year as well. But what better thing to bring before God in prayer than those broken relationships that are all around us that are part of our daily lives. And then we come to the pinnacle of our passage, an extremely difficult thing to do when we first see what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. We're called to follow Jesus' teaching and example. Can we jump back, Noah? We're called to follow Jesus' teaching and example. We see that in Matthew 5. Can you run it, Noah? Thanks. Thanks. We see that in Matthew 5 where Jesus says these words, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Paul's words here almost sound like what Jesus is saying in Matthew 5. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Right? Instead of cursing those who curse you, bless those who curse you. Luke 6 gets at that same idea. I tell you, who hear me. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And what this has to do with, as we saw in Matthew 5, is being identified as a son of your Father in heaven. We saw it last week in Matthew 5, verse 9, in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Right? Love those who do evil to you, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Again, this is a matter of identifying with Jesus Christ so that just as the capital S Son of God laid down his life, did everything he could to reconcile and make things right and show love to those who are his enemies, so also you are a lowercase s Son of God when you do the same. But this isn't something that just Jesus said to do. This isn't something where Jesus said, I'm going I'm to say one thing and do another. But no, Jesus himself practiced this at the end of his life as he died for his enemies on the cross. Luke 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus himself blesses those who curse him. Jesus himself prays for those who are literally putting him to death at that very moment. Further, rather than distancing ourselves from people that we've had problems with, rather than run the other way, we're called to step right into whatever their situation is and we're called to empathize. When when we empathize, we feel with what a person is going through. Look at verse 15. Paul says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Don't be so far away from people, whether your enemies or your friends, that you can't understand where they are, but instead get right alongside them and put yourself into the emotions that they're feeling at the time. And again, with regard to both enemies and friends, we don't think highly of ourselves. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. It's a picture of humility to say, I want things to be right. It's a picture of humility to have that kind of sincere love to say, let's live at peace with one another. Then we really get into the heart and the core of what it looks like as far as sincere love. Verse 17. 
Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Well, pastor, she gossiped about me first. But pastor, he, in, he, he attacked my integrity. Pastor, they didn't follow through on their promise. They said they'd do one thing and they did another. Pastor, you don't know how much damage they did to me. Pastor, this seems unforgivable. I don't know where the line is. They crossed the line. I'm never forgiving them. And I'm sure in the first person sense, I can't understand what everyone here has gone through. I don't in a first person sense understand the way that you've been burned and the way that you've been hurt. But I do know how broken our world is. I do know how broken some of my relationships and personal interactions have been. And I do know beyond a shadow of a doubt what God is calling us to do. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. It's what we're called to do. It's what God's Spirit enables us to do. God never leads us into a situation where he doesn't give us the grace to do what we're called to do. And this is one of those situations. And hard to believe Paul doesn't even stop there. Second half of verse 17. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is the tough one. I have people in my life, you probably have people in your life, who finish this verse differently than the way Paul finishes this verse. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, some might say, get the perfect grades. Feel that sense of accomplishment. If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, Work as hard as you can to get out from under that upside-down mortgage. To work with all that you have to get your financial bearings again. If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, get your presidential candidate elected. I'm not singling anyone out. My Facebook feed shows like five candidates who are perfect for America. And so... Um, I'm not singling out politics. I'm not singling out financial security. I'm not singling out good grades. All those things are good. And in some sense, all those things confirm in me that when we have a desire to see something happen, we give it our all. If it's possible, as much as it depends on me, I'm going to make this happen. Paul says, apply that same singularity of mind. Apply that same passion. Apply that same zeal to living at peace with everyone. Through it all, it always starts with God's grace. Because Jesus did it for you first. His is the most sincere love you'll ever see. And his is the best love you could ever show to anyone else. I'm going to get real here because we might say, okay, that sounds, it was really good rhetoric and that was really powerful and really convicted my heart, but I don't know what that looks like, Pastor. What I want you to realize is that that might not mean that your ex husband or your ex wife is going to be restored to you in a marital relationship. But maybe it means living at peace with him or her means that you can have a civil discussion about how your kids should be raised. Maybe it doesn't mean that you can share your deepest and darkest secrets with someone in the church here who has burned you, who you for years have not been able to recover from. But maybe it means that you can genuinely smile at them on a Sunday morning and say hello. How are
How are you? It's a picture of living at peace. Maybe it doesn't mean that you even talk with someone who absolutely broke your spirit in an abusive relationship, whether it's a father or an uncle or any other situation that took place. Maybe it doesn't mean you can even talk to that person, but maybe it means by the grace of God and by His Holy Spirit working in you, your heart doesn't race at the mention of that person's name because you're so filled with anger. Oh, I can't even think about that person and what they did to me. As far as a practical way to do this, next. For understanding, we have to communicate well. We have to say what happened from both sides. We have to be able to communicate and say, when you did this, whether it was two minutes ago, two years ago, or two decades ago, when you did this. I felt so discouraged because I felt like our trust was violated when that happened. Here's how I think we can make peace again, because I want it, and I know that God can bring peace. You will say from the other side, oh, it breaks my heart. I had no idea you saw it that way. I could see how you would. I would never want to do something to harm you. I want to make things right. To be able to sit down and say what happened, to listen to what happened, to not be so defensive, to say, you can't tell me I did anything wrong, or I can't tell you you did anything wrong, but instead to be able to say, this is what happened. This is how things can start to be made right. We have to separate the person from the behavior in those situations. Just because someone does a bad thing doesn't make that person a bad person. We have to be able to say, yes, you broke my heart. Yes, you burned me in that financial transaction. Yes, I didn't think I'd ever be able to be, re be recovered from that situation. But you aren't a bad person because of it. When we label someone who's done a bad thing as a bad person, what we're doing is functionally saying, you are irredeemable. You could never be good again because of what you've done. And brothers and sisters, God never said that about us. Praise the Lord. Because we should never say that about anyone else either. One last section of Scripture and then one last story. Verse 19. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. As the worship team was practicing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I think sometimes one of the reasons we hold on to a grudge is that we're fearful that God's justice isn't enough. And this passage speaks powerfully against that. You don't have to be afraid that God's justice won't be quite just enough but instead you can leave it to God as far as the way that he handles the situation. We continue. Verse 20. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Some of you know I spent Monday and Tuesday in Tennessee this week. I was, uh, I was visiting with a pastor and his wife and a few of uh, a, a group of church elders who are from the country of Burma. You might know Burma more as Myanmar because that's the, the name that the country changed to. It's a country in Asia. And uh, there's a group of Burmese refugees who had been living in Burma who were heavily persecuted by extreme Buddhists who live in Burma. And when Burma received its independence and became Myanmar, uh, what happened was the, the, the UK uh, colony that, that had existed there, the leadership went away and a corrupt and evil leadership took over. And these extreme Buddhists said, we want to do everything we can to wipe out Christianity. So they formed an army and uh, there are no natural enemies of Myanmar. They don't really need an army to defend its borders or defend against 
foreign enemies. And so what the army would do was go village to village and they would target Christian villages. They would burn their crops. They would destroy their homes. We were told that army officials, if they were able to, to steal Christian women from a village and convert them to Buddhism, they were able to go up in ranks as far as their status in the army. These Christians that we interacted with were able to become refugees, went to a refugee camp in India for a few years, were granted status by the UN to come to the United States as religious refugees. They've settled here, are, are, are working in, in low-paying jobs, are, are serving well, they're, they're citizens of, of our country, and they've joined together as, as a body of believers. So they wanted to meet with us because they love biblical theology. They love what the Reformation speaks about holding on to Scripture. They, they love what God is doing even in the Christian Reformed Church. And so they're exploring a relationship, maybe becoming a Christian Reformed Church themselves. And so we met with this pastor. His name is C. Young. And C. Young said one of the ways that he's ministering in the community around him is not only serving those church members, but also serving other Burmese people who've come into the Knoxville, Tennessee community. So he said to us, one of the people that's really on his heart that he's reaching out to, there's this family of Buddhists that believe nothing of what Scripture says, want nothing to do with Jesus Christ, and yet they believe that this man somehow has a connection with God. And so they said, Pastor, we want you to come over two, three times a month to pray for us, bless my wife and kids, bless my home. Human response. No way. After what your people have done to my people, after all the cursing that you've brought down on us, the last thing that I'm going to do is bless you. And yet, faithfully, two, three times a month, Pastor C. Young and his wife go to this family's home. They pray for them. They bless them. They ask that God would do great things in them. They're hoping that God would give them the greatest blessing of all and have their hearts turned around to accept Jesus Christ. But I hear what Pastor C. Young is doing, and I say, that's exactly what Paul is calling each and every one of us to do today as well. To be that kind of peacemaker who not only makes peace with those around us, with peace with those who have done what seems to be irreparable harm to us, but to say, God calls me to share that same peace, that same reconciliation, that same restoration that he's done for me. God's called, it, called me to do the same to you. So rather than being overcome by evil, his pastor and his community of Christians, is overcoming evil with good. They're hating that evil of hanging on to the resentment, the grudge, the pain, but instead they're clinging to the good to say, this is amazing grace. This is what it looks like for Jesus to show his love to us, and this is what I'm showing to you as well. And so in closing, we're encouraged by God's grace and spirit, let's overcome evil with good. Let's show that grace and mercy and forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation it can be such a challenge. Let's trust in God's grace and spirit to do that through us so that our love is sincere. Shall we pray together? Our Heavenly Father, what a huge challenge you've laid before us in your word this morning. God, what a huge challenge it is to ultimately cling to you, to see our identity in you, to be consumed by you, to be made one and have our identity in you, Christ Jesus. But God, that's our prayer this morning. God, we know that this is a process. We know that this isn't easy. But God, I pray that today would be day one of being peacemakers. Today would be day one of being people who seek out reconciliation. Today would be day one of people who are so sincere in our love that we show it to people around us whether they deserve it or not. God, help us to be wrapped up in what Jesus Christ has done for us in the cross so that we can say, 
God, may your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. God, may your kingdom and its causes of grace and mercy and love be so evident in our lives that people say, there's no doubt about it, their love is sincere. God, work in us. Help us to sharpen one another. And by your spirit, empower us to do this. We pray this all in Jesus' name.